We're in the middle of the second psychedelic revolution. Fueled by books like Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind, interest in the drugs is spiking. For them to be truly accepted into the culture, many are hoping that medical trials will show they work as medicines. So it's a significant moment as a new film comes out showing the inside of one of the biggest studies so far in the UK using psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, to treat depression. No, 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 no. He was taken back to a very, very difficult memory. People can go through their whole lives without ever really facing those demons. This was the big ride. This is the one that changed things. And it found a very mixed and fascinating story. I was so surprised. I mean, in the first psychedelic trial or medical psychedelic trial in the UK, and they, they want to let cameras in. And we said to him, look, you know, I think it's brilliant that you want us to do this, but we're not going to make a film where we are compromised in any way. So we need to have access to all areas. We need to be able to ask whatever we want to ask. We need to just produce the film that we see that is presented to us. The film, Magic Medicine, follows three participants, all with serious, treatment-resistant depression through a high-dose psychedelic experience. On the morning of the session when people are having the capsules, especially on the high-dose sessions, it's a very strong dose of psilocybin, just this feeling of, you have no idea where they're going to go, you have no control, um, and it's just this big act of surrender and trust. And for someone who is maybe just coming to this subject completely fresh, they've just seen this film is saying they took people with depression and gave them magic mushrooms and just think, that doesn't even make any sense. Why would you do that? What's, what's behind it? Yeah, no, I, I really felt that the other day. We were making a poster for our new study. We're doing another psilocybin for depression study and we were making a poster for recruitment and it just, you know, it was like, have you suffered from depression? Are you interested in taking magic mush? I mean, it just felt like, you know, a kind of a crazy thing to be asking people to do. And that's how after having worked in it for years and years, I can still see that it's kind of, how people see that. Um, it makes, it actually makes a lot of sense because, um, well, the, the work at Imperial is, is work using brain imaging. So we have an understanding now. Well, so Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt, who are the, um, they've led this research program and they're neuroscientists. And they have, um, through sustained work going deeper and deeper into the neuroscience of it, they have, uh, they have realised that actually psychedelics, um, they deactivate what's called the default mode network. So they have this, this, this effect of kind of introducing some flexibility in, into the brain. So where things have become very rigid and very set in their way, so people get stuck in very negative thinking patterns, ruminating, um, magic mushrooms and other psychedelics too have this effect of introducing a state of intense flexibility for, the, for while the session is going on, and then the brain seems to kind of reset itself. Of 20 seriously depressed patients in the study, the treatment didn't work at all for three. Another three are now depression-free. The other 14 had a window of between six weeks and six months where they were no longer depressed. I kind of feel like the film ends where they are now. And so if I'd been filming for another year, I don't think it would have made a difference. I think the film kind of ends as to where these guys are now. Um, and how would you summarise that, where they are now? They are not in a good place. They just aren't. Mm. You know, in the film, um, Rebecca, John's daughter from The Scottish Farmer, you know, she was saying better to have seen Dad, you know, for a brief moment again, than not to have seen it at all. Because he got... He, he, he thought he was fixed. Yeah. He, was, he, he came out and he said, I am fixed. I, I, and he was for, you know, probably four weeks completely and then eight weeks, kind of, and then 16 weeks, a little less and so on. And now he's back to, back to where he was, maybe, maybe even worse, I don't know. So I'm glad it showed that very mixed picture because it's an important message, especially in these times of so much enthusiasm in the circles of people that have know about psychedelics it's still a very small little niche but for people in that that world or they've experienced it themselves and had a profound benefit there's so much hope so what does the story tell us about the potential for this therapy why does it work 
and how could it work better? The other thing is that it really is a process. It really is the beginning of a journey. It's a, it's a very powerful entry into a journey. It's a very strong beginning. Um, it can achieve in one session what normal therapy might take a long time to achieve. It's very experiential, it's very real, but it's the start of a journey. It's not the end of the journey. So there's all, you know, it's like peeling an onion. There's more layers and there's more layers and more layers. So um, the idea that, I mean, some people have had these kind of mystical experiences where they, they have an experience where they feel that they suddenly see themselves in the world in such a different way that that kind of changes everything. They don't fear death anymore. Um, the way they see other people is different. That does happen. But from what we saw in the last study, most people have, are, are suffering from depression again now. Um, and, and they have really, really wanted further psychedelic work. That is the work that they would have wanted. Is there a tension between, because a lot of the time with, with the medical model, the idea is you take a pill and it has this effect on you, like it's a very kind of material idea or a very mechanistic mm -hmm. assumption. It feels that there's something very different going on with psychedelics. Do you think there's a, there's a weird tension there? <clears throat> I think it's a very good tension because I think the tension that is there has the power to really transform our system of care. I think what psychedelics bring about is this absolute paradigm shift in that you can't use psychedelics in that way. Psychedelics will never be able to safely be put into a kind of conveyor belt system of care. They will radically transform any system of care they're brought into because in order to do them safely, um, you need all the things that I think are important for therapeutic change to happen. So you absolutely cannot give a psychedelic substance to someone without proper trust. And that means proper trust that they have for themselves, for the therapist, for psil the psilocybin substance, like proper, proper trust. And that doesn't get developed overnight. You have to, you know, you have to spend the time getting to know someone before that can develop. So there's also this importance of being very real in, in the relationship with the, with the person because you are about to embark on this journey together. You are both going to be there in that room with them having these capsules of psilocybin and they could go anywhere. They could go back to um, a traumatic experience in their life that is, they feel that they're going through again. They could be crying in pain. They could be facing something absolutely petrifying, terrifying that they don't understand or know what it is, but feel that they're being pulled apart. They could die. They could feel not literally dying. They could feel that they're having what, you know, it's like an ego death experience. Um, feel that they're dying or exploding or, you know, it can be very, very intense. Um, they can have sweet, blissful experiences of oneness and connection to all things. Um, but you just don't know where they're going to go. But you have to be with them when you're... It's, it's kind of like a roller coaster and you have to be there on the seat next to them, wherever they go. So there's just no space for some kind of slightly disengaged, half their relationship that you might have in normal psychology services because you see people for an hour every hour. This is a full day together and you get to a very real place and you get to know each other as people, as human beings. It's not doctor patient or therapist patient at all. It's two human beings doing something very human and profound together. As you sort of just said then, a lot of the, the psychedelics can give an insight but often that insight will be something you need to work on. Yes. It, it won't be a kind of connection to everything and then suddenly feeling like um, much more whole. It can be, wow, I never realised that I had this pattern or I had this pattern or I behaved like this. And then it's up to you to do the work to make yourself well. Exactly. Which is, which is very different to the kind of classical medical model. Yes, it's a very much an active process, not something that just happens to you. I mean, the fact that the experience itself can be quite gruelling is, is, really, is really the start of that process. It's not something to be done lightly. It's, it's all about willingness, willingness to surrender, to open up, to, to feel things. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's not just the, the day itself, which can be kind of like a really hard slog, exhausting, you know, six or seven hours of, of different emotional experiences, exhausting for people. Um, they can cry more than they've cried in their whole lives. They can feel, even the ecstatic states can be quite physically tiring. But then, yeah, after that, there is this, people often describe for a, kind of a few weeks afterwards, or maybe even a bit longer, this sense of spaciousness and openness afterwards, that having been stuck in very fixed patterns of rumination, they suddenly feel like the lights were turned on, or they feel a bit freer and there's more clarity. And there's this 
we think it's a kind of um, window of opportunity in terms of brain flexibility that it's, things are more flexible for a certain amount of time afterwards and then it might get harder to change habits because things get more set in stone again but there is this window of flexibility where if people want to change their behaviors in that time that is really the key time for a therapy to maximize that that possibility but if people are on their own um, you know, people have the experience and then in our study people would have the experience then they go back to communities that don't know anything about it necessarily or doctors that don't know anything about it and family members that aren't really sure about how it works and they might have ideas about what they want to change but I think people in future as we optimise these treatments people will benefit from having much more, um, much more therapeutic support in those first weeks to really help people determine okay what's going to be different now, I've seen this, I've felt this, what am I actually going to do tomorrow to, to start changing the patterns. Sitting as a therapist in one of these sessions, it's a bit like you're witnessing somebody choreograph their own very, very unique therapy session. They go in ways that you could never have predicted or even designed yourself because they're so subtle. So you go into the session, you don't know what's wrong. Really, you understand that someone's suffering from depression, but you don't really know why or how. Or... And they will go through a sequence of um, visions or lessons or they'll go from here to here and then it'll change and it'll shift into something else and at the end of the day when they're talking through their experience you're left with this profound sense of respect for the process that that person's unconscious mind was somehow able to take them on this journey back towards some kind of health or a journey with a step in the direction of balance and health so that's it's so exciting to me the idea that we hold within us this potential for, for rebalancing that it's not coming from a therapist. The therapists in psilocybin therapy do very little, really. It's more providing the safety in the space and it, some of the experience of what kind of things can come up so people can feel trust for you. But essentially, it's all about the person themselves and what's happening within them. And that is the most exciting thing because that is what gives me hope that... I mean, how could a manual that's been written or help everybody? How could some very kind of like... kind of rigid template ever be right for everybody we're all worlds within ourselves we're all unique universes so it, something that allows those universes to inside each of us to come in balance i think we could see a massive change in how effective treatments are because they haven't worked that well up to now i mean psych um talking therapies and antidepressants work for like half 50 percent of people it's a lot of people that aren't helped by them this could really change our healthcare systems and is there one particular thing that you think people maybe on the outside of psychedelic um, this this subject maybe don't understand but should understand? I think that they're, they're non-specific amplifiers so what that means is that um, they aren't inherently good or inherently bad um, some people often people describe that after a psychedelic experience they feel more connected to themselves and other people in the world around them and they feel much more concerned about protecting nature um, and actually they might feel a little bit more um, concerned. I mean, after near-death experiences, people come away from them and often feel that they're much more, they change their life and they want to do things for other people rather than worrying about material things. It can be that same kind of thing, a sudden awakening of what's really important. However, there's a romanticised view that giving psychedelics to people would make everything better. There have been people in the past that have used them and have become, the kind of messiah complex has got stronger and stronger and they can become much more narcissistic. Lots of people that use psychedelics regularly have become much more narcissistic through that practice rather than less so. They definitely don't strip away the ego for everyone. Um, so they're not necessarily good, but the, you know, they're not necessarily bad. I mean, a lot of people have the view that psychedelics will make them go crazy, and, you know, and that's absolutely not true either. Somewhere in the middle, there's, <clears throat> for each person, it's a, unique, it's a unique experience for each person. Um, of opening up to something, um, of going deeper into the self, going deeper than the kind of standard mental chatter and going deeper down and what lies there will be different for, for each person.